FSD V12. Um, there was a set of videos that Bradford Ferguson has done with uh, where, you know, he gave you a ride along in your area. He gave me a ride mm -hmm. along in my area. And then since that time, we've had multiple versions of FSD now that have come through on the on the on the 12 stack uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.1. I don't even know. There's just so many mm -hmm. different ones. And it's been sort of fascinating watching them build on a brand new approach, this end-to-end -end neural net approach that they've sort of been uh, working in earnest, I guess, for the better part of a year, year and a half, that end-to-end -end, uh, training uh, process, I guess, that they're building. And just off the bat, just your high-level take, where's your he head at as far as the work Tesla has done so far, where do you see it going? And then we'll turn this into a nerd fest. So uh, I'll give you the mic, James, and then we'll take it's it from a, there. It's a pretty remarkable departure in behavior from V11. It, uh, I uh, initially, I, and I think we're, you know, we've, we've all driven multiple pre prior versions. And so the experience on pre prior versions was, you know, this problem that you had before went away, but these others linger. And so it was like, there was this pile of problems and it kind of gradually got smaller. And with V12, it's just like, and like, you know, <laughs> it was like all the, cause it's not derivative. Right. So all of the behaviors that we saw before that were problematic, they're just gone because it's a different product. It's not a modification of the previous one to a first approximation. Right. I mean, there's some stuff that get carried across in the perception stack and stuff, but 11 had already progressed to the point where the majority of complaints people had about it were about planning. They weren't about perception. I mean, there was a point in nine, you know, there was points in 10 where it was pretty clear that the car just, there were things it wasn't seeing. Right, it had perception limitations, but you know, it's eleven. Yeah, I don't think that was really going on. I mean, there occasionally something would pop up, but almost all the complaints people had were the system, the plan the system was coming up with for what it was going to do in the, over the next 20, 30, 60 seconds or whatnot. It just frequently it was wrong. You know, it was making decisions that would that, that were kind of poor. And then there was control, which is kind of a different thing. The you know, robot to a robot, if the wheel is jerking back and forth, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> you know, it's, you're sitting still. So having the wheel move doesn't do anything, but it drives people crazy, right? You've got all of these little sort of, um, you know, things that people don't like. And then you had the very legitimate problems with planning where the car would be making decisions that not just that made people uncomfortable, but that would cause you to miss your turn. Uh, they would annoy people around you, stuff like that. And that's just gone, right? So 12 is 12 is a huge win in terms of what I would say is, you know, like 99% of all the problems people were experiencing on, on V11. So great. Uh, it's, uh, I was expecting it to have more problems than this. It, it, when you do something really new, especially they're not just you know, do some doing something really new, but they're pushing out a product that looks a lot like a product that they've been pushing for a long time. And so they've got a set of expectations that they have to fulfill. And not just because they don't want to customers to be upset because they need it to be safe. So if, if the system fails egregiously in a way that the previous system worked consistently, like that could be bad. And so they just can't afford to do that. So um, so I expected that when they pushed it out, like it would have some bugs and it would be super conservative, um, because you just, you know, you want to give people a chance to warm in to the new system, to get used to it before you start letting it. And it, it, my sense of the thing is that, um, they had a lot of confidence when they pushed it out because they didn't, they didn't tighten the reins nearly as much as they could have. And, um, and they went out basically full featured. It, you know, on, on the first one and it works, right. It, you know, you just don't have interventions anymore. I, I uh, was telling Hans asked, did I get a chance to drive it yet? And when I, I got 12.3, a couple of Sundays back when they were, when they were pushing it out. And the first thing I did was like, you know, I spent three hours just driving all over the part of LA I live in just random pin drops and take, taking me to neighborhood. Like I did a bunch of neighborhoods I've driven. And then I did three hours of like places I've, ne I've never, that I never go, or I've never been in LA. LA's big. So there are lots of places I've never been. And, uh, I didn't have any interventions. It was just like rock solid the whole time. It, it cruised through everything. And I spent all my time being shocked because I, one of the things in my neighborhood around here, we, uh, we don't have a lot of speed bumps, but we, 
uh, I live in, in hills, you know, drainage channels are really important. So a lot of our streets have really steep drainage channels at the two, at the two sides. And you got to be careful with how fast you hit those, you know, because my car will just bottom on those like every single time. So 11, it just couldn't do those. Like it was terrible with the dips and 12 was almost perfect. There was one, you know, that, that wasn't so good, but you know, I drove over 50 of those things in the span of a couple of hours and it just like nailed them right after another. Every, I went through a neighborhood that was just festooned with speed bumps. It got everyone perfect as far as I'm concerned. I mean, you know, people will quibble about what the best way to do different kinds of things is. I have these, I have some really horrible UPLs around here. They're just like totally blind. Like you can't see oncoming traffic until you're in the road. You just can't like the, that's just the geometry of the intersection. And so people around here, they just, they don't drive those intersections. You go a couple blocks to where there's a light. You just, but you know, frequently that's what Google picks, you know, or what it, whatever the nav algorithm is, it just, it routes you down these things. In fact, the most common intervention I have is like, don't turn there. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to intervene here because I want to go this way instead, because I don't want to do that. That's that unbelievably painful left into fast oncoming traffic, completely blind. And I let V12 do a bunch of those and it was fine. It, it was, uh, I didn't, it's weird to say that it's better than me, but I'm super apprehensive doing those things. You know, I mean the, the right solution, because you can't see is you, you get right up to the line and then you slow slide out into traffic slow. So people coming, you have coming, have plenty of time to see you. They can react. Right. And, you know, I kind of want to get going, you know, as soon as you start getting into traffic, the urge to like take off, you know, as soon as you feel like there's nobody coming, but, um, V12, it would, you know, it just dead smooth slides out into traffic until the B pillar can see up and then, then it takes off. And so like, weirdly, I felt better having it do it. than it felt like somebody competent was driving the car, <laughs> you know? So anyway, I had all kinds of wild moments like that. It was, it was super fun to drive. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, I mean, we're going to learn a lot. And then over the next say six months, I mean, you know, in Elon time, two months, but, uh, it, uh, there, you know, we're going to see a couple more revs roll out. We're going to see them address some of the shortcomings in the current system. We'll, we'll see how well they're able to do that. Um, we don't get a lot of insight into how much compute they're using and that kind of stuff, but it's, it's promising. I mean, Elon recently said that they're at least near term, you know, compute restrictions have been alleviated and, uh, and this, it is very much more the case with the way 12 is being developed than was true with 11 where most of the improvement is humans out of the loop. It's like, get the data, curate the data. You know, it's, it's more compute. And he, he's also said recently that compute constraint, like that was their constraint. It didn't used to be, um, on, you know, when you've got 300,000 lines of heuristic code, uh, you have these other issues. I mean, for, there were a year or more where the comments we were hearing were about, you know, coming up with a new compiler or having to optimize this kind of thing, or, you know, they weren't architectural changes for the most part, there were architectural changes, but they were having to do a lot of optimization when you're doing a lot of optimization, you know, there are guys in the back cranking away on the code and your optimizations, they're going to introduce bugs. Your customers are going to see some of those bugs and you're going to have a fire drill to deal with that really quickly. You know, there's just going to be a lot of that and you're going to be personnel constrained much more than you are, I think, in the paradigm that they're in, that they're in right now. Now, so how fast did a, a thing that we don't know is like, how does improve, how does performance scale with increases in data? So data, I don't know how good their data quality is right now. Part of what they'll do is you know, they've got a set of data that they're, <laughs> thank you, Apple. Um, they've got a set of data that they're, <laughs> they've got a set of data that they're training against right now. And you can always go back and make that better, right? You can do more, you can, you can refine the data set and data quality is super important. Um, and, but then there's the question of adding data and, uh, does, you know, is it going to be, you know, logarithmic? Is it going to be exponential? Like how, as data gets added, how much, how much improvement are we going to see? There's not a lot of research in this area where we can look at other products or, uh, other work that's been done and, and say what it's going to be. So we're just going to have to kind of empirically see, you know, they'll do a couple of revs and we'll see, I mean, we know that a number of the things that are coming out over the next, uh, I mean, uh, you know, the next three dot revs 
are supposed to include like significant, you know, the ability to back up, um, parking is supposed to get better. Um, you know, and the highway stack, it'll get integrated at some point. I mean, they, and, and the, they may have some other, you know, goodies for us coming. So the, the features are things that people will talk about as the features show, but the more important thing I would argue is how do the core capabilities, like how is this, the sol solidness of that? How does that evolve over the next couple of months? Cause that's the thing that's going to tell us, you know, how close are we to that moment when it's enough safer than people that it opens up all these other possibilities. So you can give it to your grandmother, you know, and she'll be happy driving with it. It'll be safer than she is. Um, you know, that at some point regulators won't make us put a human in the car and you can send it to get the kids at soccer practice without somebody behind the wheel. And, um, you know, they're just, or, you know, in robo taxi, robo taxi becomes a possibility at that point too. But we'll, we'll, I would say, um, you know, 12 definitely makes it feel like that timeline has been pulled in for when all of these amazing things become possible. And, uh, and I would say, I would guess that in the next three months, six months or something like that, we'll have a much more firm idea of just, you know, what it's going to take, uh, to get to that point. And I'm still optimistic that, that, you know, we're looking at a year or two kind of time frame for that. So I'm yeah. really excited about it. I've had a great experience with it and I'm looking forward to this weekend uh, we're, uh, Karen and I are coming out to Austin to go to the eclipse. And, uh, nice. so, uh, so I'm going to be in the cars constantly for the next two weeks. I'll get a lot of practice. That's awesome. Yeah. A lot of really insightful things you, you said there, the, the thing that really sticks out to me, maybe help me un get my head wrapped around this because it's, it feels like a giant deal, but I don't know how to conceptualize it. I don't know if this means anything within this context, but the thing that really blows my mind, it really truly blows, blows my mind is that there are cars out there on the road right now that have hardware that's like five years old. So 2019 hardware, three cars that are able to take advantage of the quick the quick pace of improvement with the version 12 version 12 stack where they've essentially the layman's way that i put it for for um for folks that are not super in the details is like tesla has basically offloaded you correct me if i'm wrong here but tesla has offloaded all the heavy lifting of coding and a a uh, full self-driving thing to an ai in a very you know in a very simple term it's like here you go ai figure out how to drive and the ai is like cool here's how you how you drive right and they're able to take that and put it on hardware that's five years old in a thing, which is a car that typically people view as every year it gets worse. But this thing is not only getting better every year, but now it has this AI capability that no, that's I don't think has ever been done before. How difficult is that to do in the world of in this world where you're taking five year old hardware, and you're making it work? Or is it do they have that much foresight? Like, do they have to work backwards to make it work? Or do they have foresight five years ago that this is where they were going to be? Uh, okay. It's not easy. It's a lot of work and it takes creativity and it takes smart people to do it. Um, hardware three is a really impressive hardware platform. Yeah. It's five years old. It's 144 tops of UN eight. Like it's a lot of horsepower. So yeah, it's five years old, but it's an extremely performant five-year-old, uh, system, like even at 14 and number, like it's the, the amount of compute that they get inside the power envelope and the physical envelope, it's super impressive. It was way ahead of its time. It, like there was nothing, nothing on the market. Even today, <laughs> you can't like, there are not other, you know, people putting 144 top processors in, you know, cars at scale right now, you can go out and buy, I mean, you know, Nvidia makes platforms that you can do to do this kind of stuff. And on some metrics, they're pretty good. Like hardware threes architecture, it was made to do neural networks. The GPUs were not made to do neural networks, right? So the GPUs that we do neural networks on right now, when, when we started, you know, when neural networks took off, and we finally had enough compute and we had finally sort of figured out what the formula was around, you know, 2013 kind of time frame. GPUs were the best thing that we had sitting on the shelf that you could do this with, right? The, er the early stuff is like some grad student who's got a couple of gaming GPUs and he's stuck them in a machine that sits underneath his desk. Like that's, that's what the big breakthrough machine was like back in 2013, right? You have to work with, with what there is and GPUs were what there is. Now, GPUs have been changed 
they have evolved to be better at neural networks, but their core architecture hasn't really changed. They've added some bells and whistles. They've clocked it up some. They've tweaked the memory interface and that kind of stuff. Hardware 3 was designed to do neural networks for the same amount of silicon, for the same level of technology, for the same amount of design resource. It's just better. It's just going to be way better than any GPU platform with comparable per power and you know physical metrics and heat dissipation and that kind of stuff. It's just going to be better. So thinking of hardware three as this, you know, creaking, you know, aging subsystem, I think is the wrong way to look at it. It was way ahead of its time and it's, and it's adequate. I, we, now we don't know. It's hard to look at a system that's been deployed for into customer hands and have a good idea of what the profile of use of the various components is like, how heavily was the CPU used in the core function? How heavily were the, the neural network units, the NNUs being used, how heavily was the GPU being used? How heavily is the memory interface? Because the thing is, when you push a consumer system out there, you have your core functions. And then, you know, in Tesla's case, because it's a because it's under development and the fleet is being used to develop this, they load on all this other stuff too, which is helping them gather data. It's monitoring the system. There's these, you know, they've got there's other stuff in there and it's hard to know what the mix is. So we have never known how much of Hardware 3's core capability was being challenged by what they were doing. But from the complaints that we heard or statements that we heard, it did seem like, and then one of the reasons that V12 ends up being kind of a leap forward is that they were becoming CPU constrained. So they, you know, they have a bunch of ARM cores in there that are CPUs. They got a bunch of GPUs, and then they have these two big honking neural network processing units inside the thing. Different kinds of things need to run on different processors if you're going to develop them efficiently. And that 300,000 lines of planning code, that was all running on the CPUs, right? So you've got this very time critical component, which was probably limiting what they could do, right? Whatever you do on those, those things, it's got to be done in 28 milliseconds because 28 milliseconds from now, the next set of camera frames are coming in, right? So that's the clock that's ticking for like how you need to get stuff done. And when they started out in the beginning, when when the perception was simple things like stop signs and blah, 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 then I think it wasn't as challenging. And that might be what they had in mind when they originally chose, like, why did they choose 12 cores? Like they, they thought they would need a certain amount of processing. Then they got the bag of bits one day and they decided that they were gonna do this occupancy map. All of a sudden the load on the CPUs just explodes, right? Like, because you've got all of this kind of fun fun funky stuff that you wanna run on a CPU. Maybe they're running some on GPUs. I mean, you start out writing it on the CPU. And then when you figure out what parts are really hurting, you, mi you migrate some of it to the GPUs. It's much, much harder to write code to get it to run on a GPU, right? So you've got to allocate a bunch of your best development resources to like doing that transfer. Over time, you know, as they added more function, they gradually migrated things over to the GPUs. And so like just to keep in the, the the end the the neural network processors are like a hundred times faster than the GPUs in Hardware Three, and the GPUs are like a hundred times faster than the CPUs are. So it's like a ten thousand to one split in compute there. So like when something gets heavy, you can, you know you can put effort into migrating it to some faster hardware, but the ha faster hardware is hard to use. So you're going to have more bugs. It's going to take longer to get it working, right? And anytime you got to change it, you know, there's just a lot, a lot more overhead. But over time, they migrated this stuff. But even so, that stack of rules that they were using for planning, it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually, it's like this 300,000 lines of code. Okay, so now V12 comes along. And maybe this was part of the inspiration, part of the rationale, part of the, part of the, what supported making this big change, but that 300,000 lines is gone. So you had this huge load on your CPUs that you just took off the table when you did this, right? And so now, and here's the other thing, like the fastest thing you have in there is optimized for running neural networks. So to the extent that you can describe the problem that you are trying to solve in terms of a neural network, hardware three is just way better, right? If, it, if, you dry, disturb, if you describe it in terms of graphics, you want to run it on the GPU, and that's 100 times slower. If you describe it in terms of like lines of heuristic rules and stuff, it wants to run on the CPU, and that's 10,000 times slower, right? So now they've taken the whole problem and they've refactored it. So the problem is a neural network, and it's all running on the fastest hardware they have. And so like that's just a big win. So uh, 
you know, there are ways that, you know, hardware three, the arm cores, the, the CPUs in there, um, they're decent. You know, it, I mean, 12 arm cores, that's a lot. That's a lot more than you get in your typical laptop. Like it's got a decent amount of CPU in there, but it's still just like 10,000 times slower than the NNU is, right? So moving that stuff over, you know, hardware three is born new again, right? You've moved the problem to where it's good from where it was bad. And so whatever you were seeing before as bottlenecks, it was much more likely to be a bottleneck on the CPU, bottleneck on the GPU than, than it is on the neural network. So I just, I think thinking of hardware three as like this old platform that, that needs to be updated is like not thinking about it the right way. And then there's this other point too. Like I've said this a bunch of times, this is kind of an extreme overgeneralization, but it's the right way to think about it. FSD is not a hardware problem fundamentally. Like there's a, there's a hardware floor you got to get to. You have to have a certain sensor suite. You have to have a certain amount of compute and whatnot, right? But once you've got, you know, once you've started moving down some path and you ask yourself, should I put more work into the software or put more work into the hardware? Like there's no contest. You're going to get a hundred times as much improvement working for a given amount of effort putting in put in software as you're going to get into hardware once you get to a certain threshold right now i would argue hardware three is over the threshold that's necessary to do this and the right way to focus most of the resources is to make the software better and that that my interpretation is that is what tesla's doing is it, neural networks have this interesting characteristic i mean it's true of software in general that 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 you can make software run faster on any, mo any modern platform, you develop a software application. If it's not fast enough, you send the guys back in the lab and they crank on optimizing it. And if you put enough effort into it, you can make it fast enough because the, di the difference between how fast stuff can run and how fast we make it run on our first cut. Well, like there's a new, so there's this new uh, programming language, Mojo, which is being developed by the guy that did Swift and, uh, and, and a bunch of people. And they're targeting Mojo at, at machine learning applications. But here's a, here's a little stat. So the first version of Mojo they shipped, it's a new language. So Mojo uses Python, which, you know, Python is a wonderful programming language. It's really, really easy to use. It's famous for being really, really slow. So like, you know, it's one of the slowest languages that you can write stuff in, but it's, it's so easy to work with. The syntax is really straightforward. It's the most popular language probably used today in terms of the number of people who are using it. C, C is used to write more code, but Python is a really, really popular language. Most of the neural network frameworks that are out there, they're written in Python, right? Python doesn't run the math. Python just calls these high-speed libraries. It, you know, you, are, you figure out, you know, this is a shape of your matrices and here's how you want your data to flow. This is how you're gonna pull the hard drive, you know, the stuff off the, you know, you, you, you describe the way you want the stuff to flow. And then the Python just calls these high-speed C libraries and they do all the heavy lifting, right? That, that's the way machine learning is done these days, almost not exclusively, but that, you know, that's most of it. So the guys at Mojo, they're just like, let's do a different version of Python that's as fast as C. Well, how do you do that? Well, you change some syntax, there's, you know, there's various things to it. But the net net is that you can write a program that's just a Python program and run it in Mojo. And then they have things called, call them decorators, things that you can add to the code that say, don't do this in the most general way, do it in this specific way so you can use this hardware feature to run faster, right? Okay, so uh, one of the first demos that they had was they just, they did a really simple neural network in Mojo, right? R write it in Python. And then they just gradually added additional features to speed it up. It was 60,000 times faster after you turn on all the speed up features relative to the first instantation. So the thing is that first one is really easy to write. Like you get it going really quick. It's really easy to debug. The more of these speed up things you add to it, the more brittle it becomes and the more narrow it is. It only runs on certain hardware and blah, 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 but it gets faster and faster and faster. Most of the code in the world today that gets built, and this is how the first versions of FSD would get built too. They're not, they're not running close to the 60,000, you know, speed and they're, and they're not quite at one, they'll be somewhere in the middle. Right. But there's almost always a factor of a hundred that you can pick up just by putting more engineering effort in without, without changing the hardware right now. Hardware is important. Um, but you know, when you have a big installed base of hardware, it is almost always you know, worth your time to make the hardware run faster. So you don't have to replace all that hardware. Right. I mean, it's a, you know, Apple doesn't replace all the iPhones, right. They make the software better. Right. And iPhones do get better over time. Like my, you know, an iPhone 13 can run an LLM 
You know, you can it the the, uh, the latest versions of speech dictation on the iPhone 13 is way better than when the i13 when the iPhone 13 came out, right? And the hardware didn't get any faster. It's running it's much more performant loads because it's running newer software. And this is generally when you you look at the machine learning. I mean, the hardware in the machine learning world has been it's really been working its way, uh, like. The performance that we can get out of out of out of the today's best hardware versus last year's best hardware versus the year before it's just like a shocking rate of improvement um the hardware itself doesn't so much get better as we are making hardware that is better suited to the task like we know how to do this but it takes time to make chips and it's expensive and there's risk associated with making a chip for an AI algorithm that, you know, you're going to start, you're going to spend a hundred million dollars. You're going to get all these guys. You're going to design this thing. You're going to debug it. You're going to package it. You're going to get it out into the field. By the time it gets in the field, two years has gone by and maybe AI took a left turn and went in a different direction than you thought it was. And you've just wasted a hundred million dollars. So what we have seen is that for a long time, Silicon companies, they weren't optimizing their Silicon for, for doing this stuff because the market wasn't big enough and it wasn't worth a big gamble. Now we're in a very different place. There are people coming out of the woodwork to design stuff, which is a little bit better. And NVIDIA has started, you know, for a long time, NVIDIA, you know, AI was not driving the designs of their GPUs. It is only in like the last four or five years that NVIDIA's GPUs have started getting a lot better at AI because AI became important enough to them that they were willing to like make uh, big investments in terms of, because to NVIDIA, the investment, it's not just the design investment, but when they build a platform, they use a sort of kind of a unified platform for their gaming stuff and for their data center stuff, right? And the gaming stuff is much bigger in terms of shipments than the data center stuff was right up until recently. I mean, uh, Jensen made uh, a big gamble when he made big investments in AI, because it was not at all clear that, that like that was going to be a good decision. In the gaming GPU world, like that's a tough business. It's always been a tough, very cutthroat business. And NVIDIA had succeeded by picking the right features and focusing on the right things and not compromising their gaming performance. So making all your gaming CP GPUs more expensive because you're going to favor this kind of niche application that less than 1% of your silicon is going to, that's a risk. They took it. They came out ahead and they're now, you know, the third most highest market cap company in the world. So they bet well and it worked out well for them on that kind of stuff. So, the, you know, the hardware is getting better, but that's a recent thing. The flip side is the speed that neural networks run, at, it increases like stupid amounts, like a thousand X a year. It's, it, uh, I'm running, you know, I play around with, with, uh, with networks on this laptop that I have here and I run 50 billion parameter neural networks, you know, just screwing around with seeing what they can do. And if you had like, if 10 years ago, you had suggested that like, I would be running a, a, a neural network that was more over a billion parameters, I would have like, you know, that was super futuristic that one of the first big neural networks that Google ever ran was a 1 billion parameter network. So that was, you know, that's more, that was 10 years ago, say, right. And it seemed, it was mind boggling. Like they took half a data center and dedicated it to running a 1 billion parameter thing. And they ran it for like a solid month. This is the one you may remember these things are like, you know, they processed all this YouTube video and the uh, they did it in an unsupervised way and it learned to see cats or whatever. That was a 1 billion parameter network. And it cost an enormous amount of money and a good chunk of a data center. Tens of thousands of CPUs for a month were dedicated to this, right? Okay, my laptop runs 50 billion parameter things at like, 50 tokens a second like it's crazy right so you know we've seen factors of millions improvements in in the course of a decade and how fast this stuff runs and that's not stopping right we're going to see another million in the next 10 years and it sounds crazy but it's going to happen we're going to see another million and and you know of the million factor you know, a hundred of that is going to be hardware and 10,000 of it is going to be software. Like almost all the improvement, 99% of improvement is software improvement. It's not hardware improvement. So that's where you want to put your effort. That's what pays off. And th that's what's going to happen with hardware three too. Uh, the software is going to keep getting better. And next year, the year after what runs on hardware three is going to be 10 X faster than, than what's running on it right now, because we're just going to, the techniques are going to get better and they're going to put in the time to, you know, ever more finely tailoring the application to it. So hardware three, it's got plenty of room to run. I'm not worried about hardware three. It's I think so the, the public dialogue about hardware three is just wrong. 
I think that, and that's where like my biggest takeaway from this thing is, and, and I'll throw it to you, Hans, here, is that the, for some reason in my head, and this is why you're such a gem, James, because you, you, you brought so much insight to this discussion. I didn't realize that Tesla vehicles were dragging around a piece of hardware that was running incredibly inefficiently, incredibly inefficiently versus its maximum capabilities because the approach that Tesla was taking wasn't maximizing that hardware's true potential, which was leveraging the, the cores that are designed to run neural nets, right? And now my light bulb has gone off. I'm like, oh, okay, okay. That, now, now they're actually making this thing sing. For the last four or five years, it's been like trying to have a rock uh, sing an opera. You know what I'm saying? Now they're like, is, it, is that a wrong analogy? Help. They, help they, me with they that. had a piece of code that they were really dependent on. Yeah. This this heuristic code, which just yeah. it, you can't run that on the end, and you it, you can't run it at all. Like it's right. just so inappropriate to it. You wouldn't even bother trying. You might be able to do some of it on the GPU, but it's super dependent on the CPUs. And the CPUs are, like I said, they're you know. 0.01% of the compute capability of the platform. Right. So if the direction that your product is going is leaning more and more heavily on the weakest, you know, link in, in your compute chain, then you get, you become gradually more and more disadvantaged and going to V12, like it freed them from the, those shackles. Right. So all of a sudden the potential of the platform is, is much better than it was before because they've re uh, they, the, the, the application has been refactored into ways that are much better suited to the hardware that they have deployed. Yeah. Crazy. And, and crazy. it wasn't clear how to do that before. I mean, you know, you get these path dependencies when you're developing something, right? It's like, you're, you're going in a particular direction and it's working for you, you know, and you're, you know, so you keep going in that direction. I mean, you might explore side paths and that kind of stuff, but if you've got this path that's working for you, you keep going down that path. And sometimes, I mean, I was mentioning earlier about like people's reluctance to develop new hardware for AI applications because they didn't know what was going to happen. Well, all of them could like, you know, Tesla kind of had this story going on inside, right? They developed this super powerful NNU and they put in 12 cores, right? If they put in 48 cores, they couldn't do that. But like, you know, if they put in a lot more cores, then 11 would have been running a lot better for them, right? They wouldn't have been nearly as constrained, um, you know, and it, you know, I don't think that was the right direction. And, you know, I think the long-term vision has always been, you know, Carpathy said this, software 2, software 2.0 is going to eat software 1.0. The You know, you expect all the application to migrate into the neural network and planning just didn't for a really long time. I mean, it did some. This, you know, the the bag of bits came out and that was probably the, the low point. And then they started adding neural networks you know, the, the vector space, like that came after bag of bits. So vector space is like throwing a neural network on top of the bag of bits. So now you've got a neural network interpreting your bag of bits, but you still have all of this Christmas tree decorations of rules sitting on top of that, that you've got to work. With. So then they start building other, you know, the language of lanes. That was another thing that got tossed in there. there. They had these other neural networks they were tossing in. And those things were offloading a lot of the work that the rules, the heuristics had to do. But even, even as they're adding these things, which can run on on the NNU, which make the job of the heuristics much simpler, the heuristic thing just kept growing, <laughs> right? As they were doing this. And then, and so with 12, they just got kind of a clean break. They're like, we're, you know, we're just like taking all that out. We're putting a neural network in and we're going to bet that we can get that mimicking human. And so this is kind of a risk thing that they're doing, right? This is, this neural network, it's not reinforcement learning trained. Right. It's not figuring out how to drive on its own. They 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 made this decision, which was we're going to mimic what good human drivers do. And that that's a gamble on a bunch of things. First of all, it's a gamble that you can get it to mimic humans. Also, it's a gamble on your ability to get data from good humans that you want to that you want to train on. It's a gamble that that the process itself won't be so compute intensive that, you know, it causes you to have to, and, and to some, some of these, they won and some of them, you know, they didn't exactly win. I mean, one of the things, the one I was just getting to where like, it just takes a lot of compute. It might be that a year earlier, you know, they already had a good understanding that this was possible, but they needed a hundred times as many computers, but now they have a hundred times as many computers. They have like way more data center than they had, than they had when they started. And maybe that was the whole limiter, right? Maybe they were waiting for Dojo to get up to speed or to get those 10,000 H100s or, you know, whatever, put them over the threshold. But uh, but now they've got it. 
it's, it seems, you know, that's, that's how they're representing it to us. And it seems like they ba basically got it working. And so, you know, in a sense, they got to where they had intended going for a long time, but it felt like for a while there, like, you know, w you know, at what point are they going to be able, they're going to have the right mix of all the ingredients as an organization to be able to actually do the step over to that thing. It wasn't really clear, but it, it seems like it's worked out at this point now. And I'm super um, optimistic about the next couple of years. Can you comment real briefly since, you know, we've talked a lot about NVIDIA and just the state of neural net hardware. Um, we were really talking about it in the context of what runs in the car. So the inference hardware, but you know, a lot of the same comments also apply to the data center the supercomputers, the training. Um, and, you know, I, I don't have a way to confirm this, but from sources that I've spoken to, well more than half of Tesla's capacity right now to do training is NVIDIA-based. Uh, I think the, the 10,000 uh, H100s that we know about, plus some more that they haven't made an official announcement about, um, you know, plus all the A100s that they had originally, and that that number really, you know, far exceeds what they have for dojo um and but they seem to be to a point where they are not compute constrained anymore what do you, is your assessment of where dojo is at in comparison to you know keeping up with what nvidia is able to do um the h200 is coming out and it seems like nvidia is just firing on all cylinders as far as being able to continue to provide those massive accelerations in uh, their data center capabilities. Uh, so is, is Dojo going to play a meaningful role moving forward or is it just an insurance policy? How are you thinking about that? Uh, it is an insurance policy because you don't know what the future holds. And uh, I mean, it, it's an insurance policy on multiple levels. Uh, being, you know, Tesla as an AI company is critically dependent on compute and they don't, if they don't make their own, if they're dependent on a single vendor or two vendors and they're operating in a supply shortage, that's where we are right now. Like there's a supply shortage on GPUs that could persist for quite a while. I, you know, I, I personally, I think one of the reasons why we don't hear Tesla talk about Dojo very much right now is they very much want to stay in NVIDIA's good graces, right? And NVIDIA is trading at a very frothy multiple. It's uh, 76 I checked this morning. So it's like 3x the PE multiple that other, you know, companies of its ilk are trading at. Uh, and a significant chunk of that multiple sits on their, you know, they've got 85%. They've got crazy, crazy high uh, gross margins on their hardware right now. And you get that kind of, you get those kind of, of things when you've got a monopoly or an oligopoly, whether it's transient or permanent, right? Uh, and, you know, oligopoly is like nothing less than competition, <laughs> right? So I think even though like I, I don't really see uh, Dojo as like uh, a data center competitor to NVIDIA in quite the way that people are apt to interpret it as, as uh, I mean, it's not like there's no world in which that's ever a possibility. It's just not, you know, Tesla's not in that space right now. They're not quickly going to be able to move into that space, right? Um, for reasons that have to do with like Nvidia, they didn't start this yesterday. Like they've been in this business for a long time. They've they're they've got enormous investments in their business relationships, in all the different platforms they make, in all the different kinds of things. Because you know the data center business is not monolithic. There's like ten thousand different businesses with all these specializations that that you get into. You have to have all these different people who develop domain expertise in all those areas, tailor all your products. So like that doesn't happen overnight. Like even if Tesla wanted to do that, that would be that's a 10, 20 year project to be able to do that kind of stuff. So so the the you know, the kind of the tendency to view Tesla as an NVIDIA competitor, I think that's kind of misplaced right now. It's a simple story. And you know, people who love horse races, they like doing that kind of stuff. But I don't think it's there. I don't think I don't actually think that's even a good business for Tesla, honestly. Um considering all the stuff it's got on its plate right now. Um, that said, I think Dojo is a really great architecture 
for doing neural networks. I think it's much better fundamentally, right? Than GPUs are for doing that. Now this, this whole, this conversation gets complicated really quickly because there's lots of different ways to do neural networks. There's lots of people who want to do them for different reasons. There's inference, there's training, there's, you know, at different, you know, how big a network that you're training and your requirement for energy efficiency versus all different kinds of things, the footprint you want in your data center. These are very, very complicated trade-offs to determine like which of these is better in any particular pl place. But a thing that is true about neural networks that we train right now is they have big honking matrices. <laughs> like you've got these matrices, which are thousand by thousand by thousand by thousand, you know, in uh, of numbers and you multiply it by another one. And so if, if my multiplier is 10 by 10 by 10, I have to break that matrix up into zillions and zillions of pieces and iteratively, iteratively run this. And this is the way you do it on a GPU. Like most, of the granular processors that we have today that do this kind of basic operation, they have lots of small processors with lots of small multipliers. And the reason that you do that is it's very flexible. If the matrix sizes for the popular neural networks change dramatically over two or three or four years, your processor is still relevant. You don't have to redesign it. It's not fundamentally as well suited to the problem, but it's flexible. So you're willing to take that overhead because it reduces your risk. That's not what Dojo does. Dojo is like big, 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 enormous honking matrices. Like it's really optimized for that. It's going to be really fast at that. Okay, so most of the places that neural networks are likely to go, that's a really good fit for them. So it's got this this qualitative characteristic in the way that it's built to do things, which is a big win for the problem as we understand it today. Now, it's got a bunch of weaknesses. This is really, really different. Like almost all the software out there that does neural networks, it's written for doing things the GPU way, because GPUs is what we got. <laughs> it's what we've had for the last 10 years. We've got all these different kinds. My laptop, it runs neural networks on GPUs, <laughs> right? You know, we do GPU code, that's how we do it. So if you want to do it a different way, you have to rewrite all that stuff. And believe me, there's a massive amount of infrastructure code out there, which has been tailored. So like NVIDIA could end up, even if you don't have the optimal hardware platform, you can win just because you got the software that works. And it's a, and it's a, it's a mammoth undertaking. And, you know, NVIDIA is not standing still, you know, the field moves forward and they move forward. So anybody that comes into the field, they don't have to just get to where NVIDIA is today. They have to get to where NVIDIA is going to be when they, you know, at the point that they're competing. So there's a, a huge handicap. Now, if you're developing this stuff entirely internally, so like one of the reasons that Tesla can do Dojo, and it doesn't make sense for a lot of other players to do this kind of stuff, is Tesla has this huge internal load, which is basically two or three highly specialized jobs that account for, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70% of all their compute, right? So instead of them having like, you know, NVIDIA's got like literally tens of thousands of applications that have been ported to their platform. So if you, if you want to, you know, compete against NVIDIA, you, you know, this is the problem AMD has right now and where AMD is suffering. You know, they, they, they have to pick and choose the few things that they're going to get to run well on their platform right now while they try to get their MI300 into the same space. They just, they, that's a huge disadvantage. And if you wanted to take Dojo and do that, you'd have the same problem, right? It's a, you, you have this huge software problem of, of catching up to that kind of stuff. On the other hand, if you've got five jobs, you know, and they account for a huge amount of, of the economic value of the reason that you're, that you're getting the system and you can port those and you know how big that is. Now you have a rationale for doing it, right? So, so yeah, Dojo, so it's an insurance policy against the possibility that, um, that uh, well, it's a strategic, you're not dependent on one vendor. Even if you are dependent on one vendor, if you have an alternative, it de-risks what you're doing. It also gives you a negotiating tool again, like right now, nobody's in a good negotiating position against NVIDIA, right? Because there just aren't any alternatives, but that's not the normal state of things. And it probably won't persist. At some point, it'll be an advantage to have an alternative right? To help you get better pricing or negotiate, you know, uh, for the thing. And then there's the fact that it is actually potentially a viable alternative for this kind of stuff. And for the jobs that do get ported to Dojo, I think that it will probably be more performant than running that same job on a GPU cluster, right? It's just, they've got to invest a lot of time and money into getting those jobs. Uh, first of all, you got to develop Dojo and Dojo is not easy. 
I mean, there's a lot, we talk a lot about the silicon, right? That's the easy thing. They trot out the chip, they show us the wafer. There's some cool stuff that, you know, 25 D1 die on wafer on, chip on substrate, uh, like that's all super cool. And the, you know, the, the stuff that they do at the system level, that's really cool. I used to design interconnect. They have 192 gigabit <laughs> serial interconnect, like surdies on the edge of these puppies. And I, I would like to know like, what is taking 192 gigabit per second data streams, many of them off of the edge of this chip. Now, for the chips that are just talking to each other on the die, you can just plug them into each other. You don't even need retimers or anything like that. But if you're going to go off of the, one of those tiles to another one, there's some magic stuff <laughs> that you're doing to hop to the to the next tile, to the next tray, into the next cabinet. Like there's some magic going in there, and there was nothing said about that, right? So there's there's some my guess. I think there's some secret sauce that they're not talking about at all, which is a totally critical component of this. And it's really hard to evaluate Dojo in, you know, when in my mind, there's this black hole of, I mean, if that, if that interconnect that they're using between cabinets at that data rate, if it's rock solid and it's cost effective, great. Everything's good. Right. But as an interconnect guy, I look at that and it's like my worst nightmare for trying, you know, I, I, it, it's just like, it's an unbelievably hard technical problem to move that much data across a physical medium, you know, a cable uh, between, a, between a couple of trays. This, this is not 192 gigabits. There's like a whole row of these 192 gigabit things just like feeding off the edge of this tray to the next one. It's nuts. It's an insane amount of bandwidth. So, uh, so Dojo is a really hard problem, just fundamentally, to get it working. And even once you get it working, because it's a completely novel architecture, not only do you have to like port all your stuff to these, you know, new new cutting routine, but you have to figure out how you're going to map your problems. I mean, we've the problem of how to map a neural network onto the you know the infrastructure that a GPU provides or a cluster of GPUs in a data center. That problem has been studied to death. Like it's been very well characterized and how you go about doing it. Like it's, it's still pretty magic. There aren't a lot of people who can do it, right? Like these are, it, if, if you know how to do it, you're worth $5 million a year. Like you, you can write your own, you know, because there are very few people who can do it and it's a super valuable capability. So, you know, don't want to minimize that. Flip side is, you know, Dojo, they have to do that stuff from scratch on a whole new fabric, a whole new set of infrastructure, right? That that's an even harder problem. There are even fewer people that can do it. It's a really big investment. So like none of it would make any sense if your goal was to build Dojo and then go compete against NVIDIA because the hurdle is just really, really, it's like, you know, landing rocket ships and putting 40,000 <laughs> satellites in orbit so that we can, you know, uh, have cell phone coverage all everywhere on earth. Like it's a really, really big problem on that kind of scale. But if you just have a couple of jobs and those jobs are worth like $10 billion to you, you can justify spending a couple billion dollars to have a good insurance policy to get that thing to run. And, and I do think Dojo, like fundamentally, it's an insurance policy. It could turn out, you know, you could think of it as an annuity. It might pay dividends. <laughs> you know, they might get something really great out of it. And, uh, and I think there's plenty of potential there. Like as looking at the architecture, I'm inspired by it. I think it's a, it, I'm really happy that somebody because very few people are really coming up with innovative architectures to really go at neural networks at scale. And like Doja is like the only good example I can really think of of, of somebody doing that. And, and I don't think we're gonna hear anything about Dojo because I think nobody wants to piss off NVIDIA right now. And there's, no, there's no upside to Tesla for talking about this publicly, right? Right, yeah. To, to me, I mean, I don't know if, if, if you think this is like a right way of thinking about it, but this is like a super simple, simpleton way of thinking about it. But Hardware 3 didn't really start singing until five years after its creation, once Tesla has figured out how to optimize that chip for its use case. Do you think Dojo could have the same thing where it just, like people haven't figured out how to make this thing sing yet. Like they haven't figured out how to put it to work. Is that what you, what you mean by insurance policy? I just wanna well, make sure I, so yeah. It is the case. A year, maybe more than a year ago, Elon commented that they had production jobs running on Dojo. So they have Dojo. We don't know what the scale is and we don't know what jobs they're running on it. Um, 
it seems like the auto labeler was the thing that they, so I don't, if you think back to the last AI day, which is a while back now, like auto labeler, it was like 40% of their total compute load at the time. Right. So like if you, if, if you get the auto labeler running on Dojo, you know, that, that takes 40% of everything, which is this one job, and you can migrate it over to this platform and get it running. And, uh, you know, I think the auto labeler is probably still part of the stack, even with V12. I mean, they haven't told us what the V12 architecture stack is. Like I have my best guess about how it is and my best guess, the auto labeler is still playing a role because I think a lot of the perception architecture from V11 migrated to V12 using the uh, supervised, the auto labeler creates the labels for supervised training data for the perception stack. That's what it was doing before. I think there's, you know, supervised data is a beautiful thing. It's way more efficient than self-supervised or unsupervised in terms of the amount of training data that you need to get to a certain performance level. I think it'd be silly for them to not keep using it. They've got all the infrastructure. They've got all this data. They've got this auto labeler was already working great. They can keep using, keep expanding the auto labeler. And maybe it's running, maybe that's what's running on Dojo. Maybe the other thing is that, you know, they told us uh, more than a year ago that there's the second generation Dojo, like, the, you know, they, um, so there's a D2 chip. And the, the cabinets that, I mean, we've seen photos of Dojo cabinets and they're very different from the ones that, that we saw on AI day. So I think all the indication is that, that they continue to work on that platform. They may have already deployed a second generation into production. They may be using it. That maybe that's what dealt with their, maybe that's what got them over the hump in terms of their compute. Right. That's there's one thing, like if you have you know, if the part of the video processing that you're using for doing the, you know, human mimicking, you have to pre-process all these clips to extract what you want, the characteristics that, you, that you're going to to uh, use for the objective function, the, the thing that you're trying to optimize. You have to be able to extract all that stuff from the data. You also have to be able to evaluate all these video clips that you're getting from the field, right? To see if they do stuff. You might be running A-B tests, including, not including them to see how they change the behavior super compute intensive stuff. Uh, and so like, you know, if Dojo works for that and they're migrating it over to Dojo, then maybe bringing up four more Dojo, you know, a Dojo box, the, the first version they told us about, and the only one we have specs on, it's an exaflop per 10 cabinets, right? Which is tiny, it's tiny, tiny, tiny compared to like equivalent, you know, GPU packed data centers. I mean, you know, NVIDIA with Blackwell, they're getting there now. There are a couple, there are a few generations on from the A100, which was the latest, greatest thing when we first heard about Dojo, right? So, uh, and the world's not standing still, but Dojo can move forward too, and probably does. Got it. Um, the shifting gears here, uh, this free trial for FSD that has been announced, that start, is going to uh, be rolling out to uh, all U.S. capable cars sometime this weekend, which it looks like it's already started rolling out. How do you read that move? Do you think it's a data collecting move where they're trying to maybe get this in the hands of folks that perhaps don't even know this thing exists and they're trying to get it out there so people can actually maybe, you know, Tesla can gather more data from that from that release? Or do you view it as... Tesla has reached a point where it's a legitimate use case for full self-driving to be in the hands of every person. And by doing that, you'll also get better. Like how do you think this is a signal uh, of Tesla's progress? I guess I don't think it's data of... collection. Okay. And the reason is because they can do data collection on any of the cars that are out there now. Sorry, Hans, did you, wanna, did you wanna say something? Oh, yes, yeah. I was just gonna, before you answer the question, um, mm -hmm. I'd like to add one extra piece of context. And it's just, this is the way that I've been thinking about um, the take rate for FSD essentially for Tesla for a long time um, was that it was low because they wanted it to be low, that they were using the 12 or $15,000 price point or the $200 a month thing because those were essentially prohibitive measures that they were constraining the amount of beta testers that they wanted because everything else that they were working on was a bigger problem for them at the time than the data that they were using. 
and that they didn't want to expose the system to additional safety risk by having users that didn't have sufficient skin in the game um, being allowed access into the beta, essentially. And I, when I realized that, I basically it it became clear to me that eventually they would pass the safety threshold and the maturity threshold in the performance, um, both in safety and in comfort. That was another element that Elon spoke about specifically was that it really needed to behave, not only be safer than a human, but also behave like a human so that when people experience the system, that it was a pleasant experience for them. And um, so it's like, I knew once they solved those problems that then they would be willing to give a free trial out because it switches instead of trying to keep people out of the beta now you want to actually bring more and more people into it and so it it seemed to me like that was um basically just an indication of the stage of maturity in the system and so i'm curious if you know is that a correct way to view tesla's strategy in who they you know allow into beta versus not or how they're doing their pricing and and what does that mean moving forward like how could we see pricing or take rate change moving forward if that is true um okay so on the topic of whether they were intentionally limiting the population of people i don't have a good feel for that um the it's, it is probably true that it, it's certainly true. There's a certain minimum population of people you would like to have in there in order to make rapid progress. Okay. Is there an upper bound to the number that are useful? And is there a downside to having more than that? I could imagine that there might be, but I don't have any good reasons to believe that, 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 that there's downside there. I don't have good reasons to, I don't know that there's not downside there. I just don't have a good, like I can't off the top of my head, I can't think of a good reason why there would be, aside from liability. Like if you don't trust it, you might want to minimize the pool, but you can deal with that by stage rollouts, which we do see them do, right? Um, And, you know, they have an obvious incentive to like include people, which is they get paid for FSD, which is high margin revenue when, when it comes out. So there's that countervailing thing, like is what reason would rise to the threshold of being willing to give up that revenue? I kind of, you know, I have this other sort of way of, of like, I'll toss a couple other thoughts out here, right? That might be worth thinking about. Okay. The use rate, the, the take rate is something. They have 400,000 people that use it. Um, but when you, you know, if you look at the number of miles that get driven on FSD, and you calculate the total number of cars being driven by all the car- miles driven by all the cars, only 10% of the miles or less than 10% of the miles are getting used on FSD, right? So my experience with talking to people is that you get 90% of the people who almost never use it. And you got 10% of people who just like use it all the time, right? So you have this minority of people, they've gotten over the hump or they're naturally comfortable with it or whatever the deal is. They find it, accept- you know, and they use it a lot. But... <laughs> You got this huge chunk of people where it it's not acceptable to them and they got it and they're waiting for the real thing to be delivered that they can actually use day to day. Like that's been my sense for a while is one of the big failures of the point of the, of the program up to now is that of the people who buy it, very few people use it, right? Like 10% of people are using it, 90% of people pay for it. And you can imagine you pay $12,000 for this thing and you feel like you can't use it. You're waiting and waiting and waiting. That's not a good customer experience, right? So uh, so now V12 rolls out and you, they look at, in fact, what, the metric I'm most interested in of the numbers that we might get from Tesla over the next couple of quarters is those V12 miles. You know, we've been watching it go up. Well, I did the, you know, I've been watching this thing go and essentially, it's tracked the number of cars that were in the program over time. So, you know, we've gone from 10 to 11 or whatever the deal is, but people really on 11, they weren't putting a lot more miles on it than they were putting on 12, some more, right? But it was mostly just scaling with the number of cars that they had let into the program. Remember for a long time, there was a safety score thing and they weren't rolling it to everybody. And then eventually they did and that kind of stuff. But if you looked at the numbers, the utilization wasn't really going up on a per car kind of basis. If we see the utilization go up a lot on the per car, like that's a great metric 
because it suggests that they've crossed that threshold. If we, if they get to where 80% of people are using it, you know, that has sent the company a really important and valuable signal that they're going in the right direction as far as getting a product that satisfies the people who buy it. So like, that's a thing that is in the back of my head. Like there could be this dynamic going on. It seems to me, just me looking at the thing, like I am I use it for 99% of my driving. Like it's crazy. It's when I was on 11, I would go month and I wouldn't drive my car, right? Because the FSD just drove every mile everywhere that I went. But my, it's really clear that that's not the experience most people were having. Most of the people that I know, they had certain situations they would use it and every other situation they absolutely wouldn't use it. And, and that's not where you want to be. That's a, that's an indicator that your product isn't working. You're not satisfying the needs of the customers that are getting for the people who are buying it because they want it in their car to drive them around as opposed to, and robo taxi is a whole nother thing that you have to do, but there's a pretty good chance that if you can't make the people <laughs> who bought, bought it on their car happy, you know, feel like using it after they spend $10,000 on it. It, it's probably a good sign that people aren't going to get in your robo tax either, right? Because you're going to have a lot of people who just, you know, they're not comfortable riding around in it, given the behavior it has. So I'm really excited and interested to see this number. And that will be an interesting number to watch progress too. Like, uh, you know, I expect, given what I've heard, the feedback I've seen on, you know, YouTube and Twitter and that kind of stuff, I expect that number to tick up. Exactly how much it ticks up is going to be a really interesting number. And then if it continues to tick up, like if we see the utilization go from 10% to 30, 40, 50, and continue to get better with successive versions, like we'll have learned something really important about how the, how the pro pro progress the product is making. Um, so like, I see that kind of dynamic in the background too, that like, uh, Tesla has this problem they need an answer to. And they may be really excited by the prospect that V12, you know, will solve this problem that they've been dealing with. The problem that what they've been doing isn't good enough for the majority of their customers, right? And then, so that, of course, you know, that eventually turns into take rate. And people like to talk about take rates because a lot of the chat about the company is about the stock price, right? But I'm much more interested in the utilization rate. Like, I think that's a more important indicator than, than the take rate. I think if your utilization rate is there, the take rate will follow. Like that problem will solve itself. And more importantly, like, you know, and getting back to the pricing on the FSD thing, the other thing that you brought, I think Tesla thought they were gonna solve this a long time ago. Like, I don't think Elon was blowing smoke when he said, two weeks or next year or whatever. I think he believed that. And that all along, the path. Like I saw good reasons why you could credibly believe that stuff. Right. And I was inclined to trust his instincts on this, him having the information. We didn't get there. Right. But imagine that as far as the pricing goes all along this, you want to be pricing it with the anticipation that like two years from now, you're going to be pushing robo taxi, right? Okay. What does the robo taxi business model look like? They've talked about the Tesla network. So there's this, this idea that people who have Teslas could put them on the network, right? And so there's a revenue share thing that happens with that. You know, Tesla, you know, you lend your car out, it drives some miles, Tesla takes a cut of that, the owner gets the rest. Um, you know, there's a rate that you charge the customer, there's a cost of operating the vehicle. And the difference between that is like profit that Tesla splits with owners. Like this was like a concept for a business model. This is what they originally talked about. Other Everything they've said since then, which has been relatively little, has been consistent with this original idea. So maybe this is still the idea that they have. They've also talked about having Tesla owned vehicles, right? I mean, Elon has talked about them in the context of like, if, if, you know, Tesla owners don't put enough vehicles on the thing. We can supplement them with our own vehicles. You know, we know that they're working on a vehicle, not going to have pedals. They call it the robo taxi, right? It was in the Isaacson biography. Elon's mentioned it a couple of times. And, uh, you know, so we have all of this information that says that the, uh, that the forthcoming low cost $25,000 vehicle is also going to double as a robo taxi. Presumably there will be a version without pedals and stuff like that. So, Tesla will have the capability to build it. So there's that other, the other business model is Tesla builds wholly owned fleets, right? Those are, and those two, these two can be mixed, right? You can have both of these things going. Okay, now, so a customer who buys a Tesla, who gets FSD on it, they basically, they pay for FSD and then they get a car that will drive them around as much as they want. Like that's the, the FSD thing. It's not a license. If you get a subscription, it's a subscription and that's different. But for the people who bought it, they paid for it. What should that thing be worth? Well, if you run the numbers, and I've run these numbers like 
50 different ways, right? The net present value of a Tesla that's got RoboTaxi function on it, it's like a couple hundred thousand dollars, right? It's very easy to get to that. Now, it's a moving thing. It's a moving target. If what it is 20 years from now, 10 years from now, five years from now, those are all different numbers, right? But at the peak, there's a point in this process, you know, it, uh, when the RoboTaxi thing starts, initially, it's, it's competing in a rideshare market, right? Rideshare prices are set by humans who drive rideshare, mostly in urban areas in the United States. And, you know, the stats on that are really well known. We know what people pay. We know how many miles they drive. We know what the demand curve looks like on that because there's tons and tons of rideshare data that you can look at. Um, as long when you're in that rideshare envelope, uh, the, you know, basically the cars are making bank, right? Because you're not paying the driver. The cost of operating the car is 46 cents a mile. You know, the average rate for, for miles, the mile rate, the average trip in the, in the U S is like $4 a mile, but the average mile is two fifty because there's a long tail. And you look at the statistical distribution. So the average car drives 50,000 miles a year. Like I, I, I pulled the Chicago, you know, public rideshare data recently, and I built a fleet model for Tesla's running on that. So, you know, it takes 10,000, take, takes 10,000 robo taxis to satisfy the current demand. They drive an average of 55,000 miles, including deadhead miles, including deadhead overhead. It's 46 cents a mile operating and you're making 250 a mile, right? So every single one of those cars, you know, if you've got 10,000 vehicles, each one of them is clearing $100,000 a year, okay? What's the net present value of a vehicle that generates $100,000 a year in profit? It's a lot of money, <laughs> right? It's a big, big number. Okay, getting back to the question. So what do we charge people for the privilege of participating in this, right? And I think if you suggest $5,000 is a good number, like, you know, I think Elon was setting the expectation that his thinking at the beginning was, this is going to be a $50,000 option eventually. And we're going to ease people into this idea that you can participate in the Tesla network and you make good money on it, but there's this upfront payment and then we take a cut down the road. And they had a pricing idea that they were getting into. And when it was $15,000 and now there's $12,000, that was on the way to where they thought that entry thing. Now you can do the business a different way. You can charge nothing for FSD. You can give it to people for free if they, for the miles that the car uses on the robo taxi thing, and you just take a bigger cut, right? Maybe Tesla takes 50%. instead of they mentioned 30% as a, as a cut rate. Um, incidentally, that $100,000 per car per, that's satisfying current urban demand in the United States, which can suck up about a million vehicles, right? 10,000 for Chicago. Chicago is almost exactly 1% of the US urban population. That's 80% of the population, 265 million versus 333 million, 330 million people in the United States. So that's a million taxis making $100,000 a year at the point that you get to a million taxis. Right now, if you want to grow the market beyond that, uh, also, you know, if there's that kind of money being made, there's no way that no competitors show up, right? Like everybody and their brother is going to be trying to get in on this on this uh, money machine, right? So the so prices will come down, and they'll come down in response to how fast the you know competitors come in. Now maybe competitors will come in as fast as they're making self landing rockets, right? And, and maybe, so maybe there's a 10 year window when nobody competes with Tesla, right? Or maybe, because the thing is, it's a it's hundred billion dollars of profit at, at the point where you've got a million taxis, you're still in the ride share zone. And the taxis, you know, they have the kind of margin that I just mentioned, which is basically, I mentioned that this is a demand model, right? That is, we know that there's this much demand because we see people paying that money to take those rides today. We know there's that demand. And presumably, if you, I mean, robo taxis have a big advantage. Robo taxis will outcompete human driven taxis and they'll do it really quickly because, for one really simple reason, if you look at the distribution of taxi rides over the course of a day, like say in the Chicago model that I talked about, like I can talk about specific numbers on that one because I did all the math last week and I still remember it all. But it, uh, so it's 10,000, it's a 10,000 vehicle fleet to cover the worst, to, to cover all of the needs. But the thing is you have a two hour window on Friday night where you need 10,000 vehicles. And the rest of the time, you know, 20% of the vehicles in your fleet are idle. 
Okay, so if you're like, let, we'll talk about the scenario, not the one where where Tesla owns all ten thousand cars, just to have a talking point, right? Okay, so you've got two, so ninety percent of the time, two thousand vehicles are idle. So what do you do with the two thousand vehicles? You preposition them, right? Chicago is two hundred and thirty square miles. Um, so you preposition, you got 2000 spare taxis sitting around, you got a taxi within 15 seconds of every single point in Chicago. So somebody gets their phone out, they want a taxi, they got it in 30 seconds, absolutely guaranteed 24 hours, you know, anytime the taxi is going to be there for you. They can also undercut on price. Obviously, you know, if you're, if, if you've got $2 a mile of profit baked into your business model, you can come down on price. So between the fact that you can provide a really consistent experience because the taxis are always the same. No, they're never in a bad mood. You know, you never, you never get one that smells terrible. You know, it's a super consistent experience. It gets there much faster than the, because yeah. essentially and you can't private. afford to pay. And What's it's that? private. It's private. That's, You're the only person it, in the like, taxi. They're just going to win. So, so in, in that million vehicle envelope, just dealing with the demand we know about today, but and this is before you lower the price and expand the TAM, right? And this is you know before a lot of other of advantages. Like I think the fact that it take you have to wait and you're not never quite sure that it's going to show up is a disadvantage for like if you want to go to the airport, you've got to get your Uber 30 minutes early to be confident that you're going to make your flight, right? So that's wasting a half hour of your time. If you're 99.99% sure that thing's going to show up in 30 seconds, you take the you take the robot taxi to the airport more often, right? Just because there's less uncertainty and less of your time being wasted when when you know when you have that excess capacity available. So Okay, so a million vehicles, and that's a hundred billion dollars cleared at those price points. You know, if you use the human-driven stuff, not the real numbers will be lower, but we're just talking round numbers, right? Just the that's United two, States. That's a two trillion dollar micro market cap at PE twenty, assuming you're not growing at all. It like competitors are going to come out of the woodwork, and the numbers won't be this good because of that, right? Because competition will drive down prices. It will reduce the size of the market that you can address and that kind of stuff, but it's not going to become a bad business, right? It's going to be a great business. Even so there's lots of room for lots of people to compete in this market because it's huge and long-term you can grow way beyond the existing rideshare market because you can drive prices down. Like the Tesla's can compete profitably at like 60 cents a mile, right? Those, that, that robo taxi, like it's going to cost Tesla 20 grand to build that car you know, a reasonable return on that. Like if, if Tesla could clear $5,000 a year on a $20,000 investment, like that's still a great business. And that's 50 cents a mile kind of rates. And at 50 cents a mile, how big is the market? Well, it's like, my guess is 1.5, 1.5 trillion miles, best guess in today, right now. But this is, and that's before like, when you start making transport cheaper, people start traveling more. That's before that effect comes in, right? And 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 weird things start happening. But um, okay, so Tesla. Getting back to pricing, right? What's the right price today for FSD? If you're Elon, and this is what you're thinking about, right? And I think, you know, you could do it different ways. They had this idea that they were going to price. FSD at a price and they were going to take a certain size cut that would feel fair, right? 30% it would be is an eminently fair cut for a service provider in, in this kind of thing to do. Um, you know, and you have this problem that the first million people that participate are all, you know, they're make they're clearing $70,000 a year for every car they put on the network, right? I mean, people will be you know, it's going to completely distort the market for some period of time because Tesla, is, you know, a, a 2018 Model 3 with hardware three in it, you know, that you can buy today for like $25,000, you know, with 100,000 miles on it, because they'll go a half million miles. All of a sudden that car, you know, at $100,000 a year, net present value is like a million and a half dollars. Like it's crazy. It's, it's a discontinuity. You know, there's some sort of weird market singularity that's going to happen in the transition to this. And one of the ways of smoothing that out is to just make FSD expensive on the run up to when it becomes available. And so my thinking had been all along that the reason they were setting the expectation that it was expensive was they were raising the bar to participating in this market so that you wouldn't have this crazy dislocation when the capability became available. 
but the world is so different today than it was when they did that. When, when they originally proposed this, there were like 500,000 cars that could do this, right? But there are enough Teslas out there with this capability in the United States today that you could instantly saturate the US ride hail market, right? So that really would be the, a huge discontinuity if, you know, if regulators all approved it and if there weren't any restrictions and, you know, I mean, there will be roadblocks that will slow this down for sure. And I don't know what they are, but they're definitely going to be there. Um, but even so, you get this very weird uh, discontinuity and you there's the risk of a mad scramble and, you know, all kinds of stuff going in. So so the idea of setting the expectation that it was going to be expensive to, to you know, to participate, I I have always thought was a component of what was of, of this thing is. But like, I feel like it's taken long enough at this point that I'm not sure that that formula actually works anymore. And I don't know why we're still in this regime with the expectation. It's probably after you've been selling it for $12,000, if you start selling it <laughs> for $6,000, you either have to give the money back to a lot of people or you have a lot of pissed off customers, right? So it could be one of those things where they're just kind of stuck with it now, right? So how do you think about subscription prices then? Because obviously that doesn't lock Tesla into any sort of an obligation to provide that service. Yeah on the network and it's something that they could potentially, you know, bring in a lot of extra revenue for. I mean, that's, I guess that's one of the things that I'm really going to watch closely as we do these free trials, like how does pricing shift? And I mean, one of the things that I would expect, but you know, we'll see what the data shows is that they'll begin to raise the purchase prices again, um, but actually potentially lower the subscription prices or offer, you know, per mile, type pricing options or doing doing different things to to try and maximize, like you said, the actual utilization of FSD as a SaaS service and, and bring in more revenue that way. It, I think going to subscriptions de-risks a bunch of things for them and it gives them a lot of flexibility because you can retroactively change that. They could also decouple what they pay people to have private FSD for their own use versus, I mean, they're, they, they have always had the Tesla ride share only cap, you know, condition buying FSD. Like you can't use it on anybody else's ride share anyway. So they already kind of have control. They have a lock on that use of it and it could be priced differently. Um, I, I think it's really hard to predict uh, exactly what the dynamics of the market are going to be in terms of like, what are the features? Where does it get approved? How many vehicles are available there? How enthusiastically do people embrace? Because there are going to be people who in the beginning definitely don't want to do it. There might be reasons why they don't get a lot of take on the, you know, uh, customer, uh, you know, people who own Tesla's wanting to participate in the network. There's how fast they can ramp their own stuff, you know, what cities they go into initially. Like they're, Without knowing all that stuff, it's hard to know what the right pricing strategy is going to be. And my guess is they'll just be flexible, right? You see how the market responds, you raise or lower the price, but you have to do that, you know, you know, as we saw as you know, through the pandemic and whatnot, when you change vehicle prices, you make people mad. If you raise them, people get mad. If you lower them, people get mad. And some, you know, some people get really mad and it can be a really big problem for you, but you need, you need to retain the ability to make those adaptations in order to keep the market for your cars. And when RoboTaxi comes out to keep the market for your service orderly, you want people to participate. Like it's necessary as customers who like rent their cars out and also as people who ride the, the service. And that, you know, I think that's a really difficult challenge given all of the different sort of unknowns that could come to play as this thing comes because we like i still don't have any good sense of how regulators are going to respond to this and what the object and then the other thing is like we saw when ride hail came out the taxi you know the um the taxi incumbents they went nuts right and that became a huge problem for ride hail so tesla could themselves face that kind of stuff. you could see you know municipalities get upset and basically write laws saying that you can't do this, right? If it's badly managed. So I think there, there, there are a ton of risks and there's a really big reward. So you really want to try to get it right. But so I think you want to maintain flexibility, but that means that we can't predict anything, right? Because Tesla will just respond to what happens. 
So what one of the so it sounds like and they because one of the th- discussions that I that I had with Chuck Cook recently is that and I think you've heard him say is that he's still not sold that the current hardware setup with from a camera's perspective is enough for the vehicle to get to level four, which is what would be needed for for let's say for the current fleet to be robo taxi ready. That and that's besides the fact that with robo taxi, when when Tesla does decide to come out with their whatever whatever that robo taxi form factor is, that they'll probably solve for that. I mean, they'll definitely solve for that if that is a limitation, and they'll be able to make that specific unit at millions uh, of units per year, which will essentially uh, let's say create those one million robo taxis within eighteen to twenty four months at a maximum of you know, production uh, ramp once they start production. So by 2027, at the latest, they'll have those million units. But do you do you now that you've sort of seen 12 at work? Do you still? It sounds like you're still confident that that with hardware three and the current camera setup will get the company to level four with the existing fleet. Would you agree with that statement? To be fair to Chuck, he did say in an unconstrained operational domain, unconstrained which means operation. that yes. it could do that level four anywhere and everywhere versus having some geographical limitations or some perhaps intersection yeah. by intersection limitations. It'll skip like hardcore unprotected laughs if it feels like it's unsafe. Yes. Um, like, I think it will operate well enough that you can build a business around it that you can come up with ways to do that. And maybe there are geographic constraints. Like I, I don't actually find, like I haven't found any turns that I don't think the car can do. I know a lot of people, that's their sense of the vehicle. They don't like the camera placement or that there's some, and, and they look at some aspects of the way the car behaves and they take that as uh, reinforcement for their opinion that there's defects in the sensor suite that need to be addressed. When I think about the limits of the car, like what about the car makes it not a great robo taxi? Like, I think you would really like to have self-closing doors, <laughs> right? I mean, there's all of these other things that I think that you could add, you know, cause if somebody leaves the car and they leave the door unlocked, like what does your taxi do? Right? You're kind of stuck. You can't drive around with your door hanging open, right? Put a Tesla bot in the trunk. Something, yeah. Or you, you <laughs> yell at some, you know, you have an external speaker. Someone <laughs> offer close my door. five bucks to close the door. <laughs> I don't know. That's, there's so many different ways. Or just like, like, just like do a quick uh, acceleration, whoop. And then just, you know, it, you can probably Maybe. get that, you know. Yeah, I don't know. It's but anyway, like there are ways that that are, that you know a retail vehicle isn't isn't a good fit, and maybe they decide you know when the net present value of the vehicles rises significantly because all of a sudden they can function as robot taxi. Well, now you can actually justify you know spending some more money on robot taxi specific characteristics. So I also think about like in robot taxi, you want the upholstery to be different. You know, it's got to be puke proof, right? You 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 want to optimize the car for cleaning. Because, you know, basically at the end of every shift, the, you know, the robot taxi is going to show up someplace and you're going to want somebody to spend 10 minutes going in and out, getting it really clean, making it smell nice for the next customer. So, you know, when you, when you ride a train, you know, if you ride municipal trains or any of that kind of stuff, I mean, they're made to clean really easily. Right. So uh, there might be more sensors that you want inside the car. Right. So that you can see, you know, if somebody for left their bag behind, you know, you want to be able to tell if somebody, uh, if somebody left their purse or their wallet in the car, their phone is sitting on the seat. Right. And I don't know that the existing sensor suite can do that really well either. Um, so I think there are changes for a real commercial thing. I think you could build a business and I think it would be a compelling business around the vehicles that they have right now. I do think that a purpose built vehicle is going to be a better vehicle and that, Long term, like almost all the cars operating are going to be those vehicles. But like when I run the numbers, you need 25 million vehicles to saturate, you know, the likely, say, next 10 year uh, thing. And and Tesla will have built 25 million of those of those uh, of those cheap cars, you know, I don't know, by 2030 or something like that. So there's, there's definitely that. I think that the window of time when people have the opportunity, you know, to have a private Tesla, put it on the network and make a good income off of it. That might be transient, might be something that's only around for five or 10 years. Right. And it might end up being uh, area dependent, right? It might be that 
that like it makes way more sense to do that in like rural parts of the country for longer than it takes because in the the urban areas like there's really rapid turnover people are going to be way harder on the vehicles you know so the 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 you know the trade off in terms of cost benefit might be really different in the 80% of urban america versus the 20% of rural america population wise 20% of yeah. course area wise it's the other way around 80 20 yeah the the fleet piece and, and and James, I know you've been incredibly kind with the time and your person uh, canceled, but I, I still want to be respectful. When I want to keep it for too much longer. But uh, I, the the one the one fleet thing that's always been in my mind is I I think this robo taxi thing might go the way of the of the airline model where you have you know Boeing and Airbus or I guess Airbus lately <laughs> that's you know make makes the planes. And then you got Virgin, United, Southwest, Delta, et cetera, et cetera, that kind of outfit these shells into their into whatever their value proposition is for the customer. You know, Spirit is a bus in the sky. Uh, you know, Virgin is a little bit more funky and fun. You know, Southwest is like just get in and go reliably. United is God knows what they offer. So it's so and I wonder, I wonder if Robotax is going to go down that path where maybe Tesla over time becomes the shell provider and then there's customizability in the interior that people can potentially put in place. But then the 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 question that comes up too is like, I, I was initially hesitant that Tesla would take on, say they would take on being a fleet provider where they would actually have their own Teslas long term to run it because that also implies that they're going to have to maintain, clean, you know, check for stuff, et cetera, et cetera. But with the advent of Optimus and the robot, which is underpinned by the same technology that FSD is, over the next five, 10 years, is it really that hard to believe you're, that you they won't have a bot that can clean the car in, in, in the inside? I don't know. And that's that's where like it's it's starting to change my formula as it, as it pertains to Tesla becoming a fleet provider. But in the end, the I think that the breakthrough here is, is that it seems like the company is on a path to have a self-driving car. And then the, the market will figure out how to best to make it work you know yeah there's there it there's a huge range of things you could imagine going forward it i mean antitrust is going to be a thing you know that yep. if if tesla owns too much of this market um antitrust is going to be something that they're going to have to deal with because it, it you know and rightly so <laughs> right it's they're I mean, no matter how much you trust the company and the management and all that kind of stuff, you only want, you know, as a country, so many of your eggs in one basket. So, um, yeah. And, and how do you, how do you encourage other people to participate in this? Like my guess would be like under the, the current way stuff operates is that, is that the government will create incentives that will lower the barrier to other people getting in, into it. Like we did, they, they do with EVs right now. They create a financial incentive or they lower the barrier at least for being able to participate. And they might do that, right? Or there might be, you know, the kinds of things that China has where like you need to get a partner in this market and, you know, and they get some chunk of the responsibility. And it I, it's gonna be interesting to see how it unfolds because it, it's definitely not like the the other, you know, businesses so far. We, I mean, we haven't gotten to the point where like Tesla makes all the cars and everybody else has gone out of business, right? I mean, Detroit, they still got a fighting chance, but uh, you know, the robo taxi thing that could happen a lot faster because it's, it's not, uh, there aren't dominant incumbents there with deep financial resources and, you know, that are going to push back via all of these, uh, you know, techniques that they, that they have available to them. Um, you at the rideshare kind of mowed down taxis because of that, right? Like taxis, they're organized at the city level, but they're not organized at like the national or the state level or whatnot. So Uber was able to like basically take them out one at a time and and expanded aggressively by ignoring rules and that kind of stuff, right? When they were going into new uh, areas, so like we could see all that happen, or maybe not. Maybe it'll be super uh, um, collegial. I doubt it. <laughs> we'll doubt <see>. that. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's so much that. potential for drama on this kind of thing, but it's really ex like, it's going to change the world. And like, and I mean, first of all, it massively, it ra it really accelerates getting petroleum vehicles off the road. Right. Cause every single one of those 20 million taxis out there is going to be replacing like four privately owned vehicles, not, those vehicles may still be out there, 
but it's going to be replacing the miles they would drive, right? I mean, it's not so much that we don't want people to own cars. We don't want them to drive them, <laughs> right? And so, well, like, you know, so there's that, right? They, we also, an interesting point, we've only, we've just talked about rideshare, right? But once you've got self-driving vehicles, like all of these other things, like going to a ski resort, you want to be able to sleep in the car on the way up there, right? Because you want to get in the car Friday night and wake up at the ski resort and it saves you a night in a hotel and all that kind of stuff, you know, and it can drive really slow if it needs to. Um, self-driving RV to take you and the, and, the, and the family around, you know, self-driving cargo vehicles for doing deliveries that do that kind of stuff. I mean, there's not just going to be a little self-driving commuter, right? There's going to be all these other things. I mean, I mean, if, if, well, I don't know, I guess when we have Optimus it's different, but like being a plumber and being able to send your truck to the plumbing supply store to get that valve that you need while you keep working, you know, like that Huge. could be a cool thing. So, um, there's a lot of potential for, and then the other thing, the van, right? I mean, Elon has talked about mm. the van being a thing because you like, Cities, I think LA is 40% parking lot by area. 40%, 40% of the useful land is, is, is parking That's lots. Insane. And, and I think if you include roads and stuff, it's more than that. So like we live in these amazing cities, you know, with tons of density and all these amenities and features for people and all that kind of stuff. And we give 60% of all the real estate to the cars. Right. And so taxis potentially change, robo taxis potentially change that. Right. I mean, if, if you, if, if in LA you can take like, you can get rid of half the parking lots and infill with, you know, shopping districts, um, you know, residential spaces, parks, you know, then that make the city becomes much more livable and much cleaner, like all at the same time. And there's, you know, um, 40,000 people a year in the United States die. Like you could get rid of a lot of that for every person who gets killed. There's like 50 people who are like maimed or go to the hospital. Right. So like, that's huge numbers of people's lives are safe. And these are young people who have many, you know, quality years of life ahead of them, $2 trillion a year in property damage. <laughs> I think that's the right figure. Like all that stuff just stops. Right. And we get all of the space back and, and everything gets much cleaner. So, I mean, it's great as a stockholder to like be super excited that the company will do really well and there's all this potential, but I think just as a citizen of the world, right? Like this is a great development and I'm very excited to see it happen soon. hundred percent agreed. Uh, Hans, did you, did you have anything on your, on your end? So I guess my question is based on the hardware limitations of what it's going to take to have a self-driving vehicle. Like what is the pathway that you see open for competitors to be able to compete with this service as far like, you know, Ford is not equipping their vehicles with the cameras and the compute currently. Uh, you know, neither is any other major OEM here in the United States. There are some Chinese <clears throat> companies that are starting to do something, but I don't know if those architectures would support something like Tesla has currently. And so, you know, like, and based on the length of time that those design cycles work and those supply chains work, it's not like if FSD worked tomorrow that Ford could go out and immediately start equipping every single Ford with those vehicles. And so that's where I'm, I'm trying to understand and think about how does that play out? I mean, do you just supercharge the comma AI approach and basically put like little cell phones in the windshields so that you have the the visibility from a camera standpoint and then have you know some sort of aftermarket computer that you put in a car like what do you what do you see as the ways for someone who's not tesla to be able to have a vehicle assuming that you know eventually the the ability to do this from a software standpoint becomes open source and easily achievable um what are the hardware pathways forward to to do this they have to make they're definitely gonna have to make new vehicles right and so there's a minimum 48 month lead time on that plus you know it's 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 probably four years from the time they decide to do it to the time they can start field them and then they have a rate limitation they have a really severe rate limitation which is robo taxis they just got to be evs right you do the math on doing it with a combustion vehicle versus doing an ev and the and the cost it just works out really different. Um, and ramping EVs is a huge challenge for everybody outside of Tesla right now. It, uh, you know, I mean, who, 
how soon do we realistically think that anybody outside of Tesla is going to be able to provide, you know, a million EVs a year in the United States? Like that, that's going to take some time. I mean, it's, it's going to happen for sure. I mean, if they survive, it, it'll happen, but, it, but, you know, because you can, you know, I mean, the battery, the battery infrastructure, I, batteries are a, a, a limiter in terms of the manufacturing rate that, that we can do them. You know, the world's only making like two terawatt hours a year right now for everybody. So there's just not enough batteries to go around. And Tesla's locked up a really large chunk of the supply that's going into the automotive business. So I think that's a big challenge. You know, the other automotive incumbents are, they're going to move to, to resolve that as quickly as they can, but it's not something you resolve in two years. It's a five-year kind of thing. So it, I have a hard time imagining how anybody can follow Tesla within five years. And it, you know, if they don't really want to do it and make some big bets and make some big investments, it could be 10. I mean, yeah. that, that's my sense of it right now. But obviously, if the government steps in, you know, and decides it's a priority and throws a ton of resources at, if Tesla becomes super proactive about handing out the technology, you know, in order to try to get people to license their service and whatnot, um, you know, that, that could shorten things up a, a bit, but I, the, the single biggest limiter over in the first couple of years after it comes out is going to be, I think, incumbents ability to ramp electric vehicles to the volumes that, that, that there will be demand for. If you're doing electric, then adding the sensor, like if you're designing a new vehicle, you can add the sensors, but they, they, you have to design a new vehicle. I think you have to put the sensors in. I don't think a uh, retrofit is just realistic. Yeah, to to me, it seems like it, it, again, this might be a silly comparison, but the supercharger network out here in the United States, uh, how, you know, it, it was obvious and clear that Tesla by far had the best charging infrastructure out of anybody, but it took years of the first person to declare it. So Ford was the very first automaker to say, hey, yep, we're going to start using their charging network because it makes sense and it's great. And then within four months, everybody else came on. It was, it just, it, it was what the first shoe dropped and then everybody's like, oh my God. And the reason why is because if they didn't do that, they would be at a gigantic disadvantage because it's no longer, oh, I got to compete against Tesla. I got to compete against Tesla and anybody else who decides to be on Tesla's team. Right. And I think I see it the same way you do, James. And what's interesting is I, I do wonder that if I think Tesla, if Tesla wants to get to a point where their licensing option for FSD becomes the primary driver of getting people on board quickly. I think it's going to have to require them to have proof that this works. So number one, they have to have a robo taxi that works. But then I'm curious to see between that time and the first person to say, like, say Ford again, Jim Farley, you know, and Elon might be best friends. Who knows? They might be partying right now. But maybe Jim's like, okay, we're going to do the same exact thing with, uh, with, the licensing of FSD. We've been talking behind the scenes for the last 12 or 18 months. We have this, you know, uh, architecture we've been, we've been building with uh, uh, working with alongside Tesla, and it's going to have FSD. And then I wonder if that point that everybody else is like, oh, shit, like, you know, they're going to have a gigantic advantage because the hardware suite that's going to re be required to make a Ford autonomous is going to be a uh, I mean, from from what I see out there is a fraction of anyone else's that could achieve level four, or even level five. So that's that's how I view it. I think I think I think it's either Le Tesla's method or no one's because Tesla's right right now. It seems like it's the only one that can be done at scale cost effectively because every other solution that can do level four, level five. But again, we got to wait for Tesla to actually get to level four, level five. But it seems like that seems like a done deal. I don't know. I, I might be thinking so, about it too simplistically, but it's an interesting parallel with the supercharger thing, right? That, uh, you know, we saw other entities come out to try to do charging and discover, first of all, it's not as easy as it looks, right? Getting, building a good system and getting it working and mostly al aligning the incentives, right? Like electrify America's main problem is their incentives, incentives were not aligned with the needs of actually making a thing. So, if you if you have an outside entity come in and mandate that there shall be a competitor, you maybe you get an Electrify America equivalent of self driving, right? Which is like this this I don't want to write know, that this, one. This thing nobody wants to actually use, right? And but it holds out, you know, a hope to a bunch of people who like don't want strategically all of these guys they're at a disadvantage if they pile into Tesla's boat, right? They become more and more marginalized 
in terms of their options for making a good business in the future. So you can naturally see why they want to have options. I, I mean, a thing that you could see is you could see people piling on, but licensing the right to switch horses to, to an alternate network provider if one arises, right? And then you could simultaneously see a bunch of people, you know, try to develop, like Mobileye would be a natural, right? Um, I mean, it'd be a natural in that they're currently in the business. They're not a natural in the sense that I don't think that they have a technology that ramps to that. It, it, I would kind of guess that if Tesla demonstrates that it works and they're significantly ahead of, of the, of competitors in terms of like having something on with the camera only suite that can solve the problem that you might see a lot of people switching to just, you know, as quickly as possible, mimic what Tesla is doing to try to, but you know, it could be Falcon nine again, you know, or just like they run around in circle, making a lot of noise and then they're, but they're not competent to actually make it happen. Have you followed what NVIDIA is doing in the vehicle space recently? Like I, and I asked because I haven't done a good job of knowing, you know, what are they, what are they preparing to put in cars and what kind of sensor suites are attached to those? You know, are they doing cameras as well or are they just offering the compute? Um, do you think there's a path there for NVIDIA to kind of provide the, the hardware Capability uh, I would, for I would guess NVIDIA won't. Go. So NVIDIA is partnering with like, you know, a, men, most of the rest of the field that is trying to get, you know, sophisticated ADAS systems into cars, you know, the, the other uh, major incumbents, most of them are partnering with NVIDIA. So NVIDIA has, NVIDIA makes tools that let you build your own learning systems, right? So they make you know, they make a system that you could buy and you could put in a car uh, that's got the compute to do this. You would pick the sensors that you wanted. They have lots of libraries and lots of tools to provide some of the functions that go into this. You glue it together, you gather your own data. They have data sets, they have simulators, they have all kinds of stuff that if you wanted to develop a competitor and many competitors, I believe, are using these systems and trying to and trying to develop stuff along those those lines. Is it competitive? Not really. I, it's, you know, Nvidia wants that 80% gross margin, right? So you buying a $10,000 Nvidia box to put in the trunk of your $30,000 car and, and you know. So, uh, in, will Nvidia get cheaper? Will they make a you know, if incumbents start getting close to being able to do this and needing to do it at volume, then Nvidia will probably start making a, a box, which makes a lot more sense commercially to put in in a vehicle. The I get the sense that the incumbents, you know, and players who are developing on Nvidia's platform right now, they're trying to do the you know Waymo minus kind of thing, where it's a it's a purpose built robo taxi platform. It's not something they're planning to retrofit into a vehicle that they send to the general public, and uh, you know. Most of them are hedging their bets. They have more sensors. They're not trying to do the strict camera. There, I think there are people doing camera only, but most of them are also, you know, tossing the other sensors in because why not? You're you're in development mode right now, and uh, and we may see some competitors emerge from that space. But I don't think there's anybody who's operating at the same. Now, of course, one of the things about Nvidia's approach is like you can train on H100 clusters, right? Or you know, that because that, that's what their tools are set to do. They're, they try to keep you inside their ecosystem. So, you know, the the libraries to train for these boxes that they have available for OEMs to buy and put in a car, those libraries are designed to run on, you know, NVIDIA DGX cluster type stuff. So it is in lots of ways, they're providing a lot of turnkey tools, but NVIDIA themselves isn't going into the space. They're making the tools. And, and they wouldn't want to because they don't want to compete with their customers, right? Yeah, that, that, that makes perfect sense. And I think I think one of the last points from, from me is that the it's interesting how, let's say you have a player today, like, an, like say like a Rivian with their R2 platform decides to, for whatever reason, partner with NVIDIA and they develop a, a self-driving system on their car with whatever sensor suite, right? Even if, even if Rivian never reaches profitability, because like, they're losing about forty thousand cars gross profit, forty thousand dollars per car per gross profit right now. Um, it, let's say it's the same exact thing with R two, but they can make 
I don't know, 150,000 R2s per year, even if they're losing the equivalent of that, if it can drive itself, all of a sudden, that loss is okay. Because the, 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 the net present value of that car, instead of it being sold at, you know, minus $30,000 gross profit or whatever that number is, it's actually, you know, over the, the five year span and Raven can collect, you know, uh, network revenue from that, all of a sudden the economics for an electric vehicle works. So then the, the math becomes who can make the most of them. Yeah. But, uh, if they, if they develop their, if, if they license Tesla's, then they can get a better platform from Tesla, plug it in, yep. but they're strategically dependent on Tesla. If they go to Nvidia, they can buy the hardware from Nvidia, but they still got to spend like a billion dollars or a few billion mm. dollars in five years to like developing the system. Like that's the rub right now. It's like developing the system is it takes a long time and it costs a lot of money today. You know, I mean, if you were starting 10 years from now, the problem will get easier because, you know, neural networks get better all the time. You know, I, I've, I've said a bunch of times and I still think it's true that eventually it'll be some like high school science project where <laughs> we, it will get to that point. But, uh, you know, that's a long way from now. And for quite a while after, you know, after Tesla's got it working, you know, competitors are going to be in this, you know, do we spend the money? And the other thing is the market really changes, right? I mean, you initially it like if tesla had actually done this some years ago they would have had to expand for a long time inside the rideshare space before they saturated it after you get past some some point after you've saturated the rideshare market you have to start dropping prices so you get more and more miles but you get them at lower and in the short run the reduction in price actually hurts you more than the increase in the number of vehicles because you know when you have really high margins the margin coming down is really painful but in the long run it's you know, it used, you know, you, I, you know, just roughly speaking, like at around a million vehicles, you saturate North America ride share, right? US ride share. You can get out to 25 million vehicles. And so you're, and you go from, uh, what did I figure the, let's see, Chicago is 10 million miles a week. Is that right? Yeah, it's 10 million a week. So a uh, hundred million, a billion a week, 50 billion miles a year. So, so when you saturate rideshare in the U S you're doing about 50 billion miles a year and there's another 5 trillion. So there's a hundred X increase in the number of miles, but the, you can't, you don't get a hundred X the profit when you go to a hundred X because the, you know, you have to bring the prices down. So you make three times as much money <laughs> delivering a hundred times as much miles. So like your profit per, per mile really goes down. Okay. The reason I bring this up is you know, anybody <laughs> like if, if Tesla is because Tesla can get so close to really quickly saturating the cream of the crop because they've already got 5 million vehicles out there. Right. So like if they got good customer uptake and if they're building their own, you know, robo taxis at 500,000 a year or something out of this factory, then the sweet spot in the market that's taken. Right. And so if other people that come in, they want to compete for that massive expansion at much lower margins and the ROI for doing the work, as long as it costs billions of dollars to do the work and takes years and you've got to develop these, you know, your own, especially if you're making your own cars and everything like super, assuming super that you can even do it, assuming that you can actually develop yeah. your own system. Like the, the, the ROI, I mean, there's going to be the sweet spot in the market, right? I predict around, you know, one, two, three million vehicle kind of where the profitability is going to be crazy high generally. And beyond that, it's going to be, it's going to become commoditized and the attraction of getting into the market is, is going to decline rapidly. And you're, and you're, it's harder and harder to fight too. You know, a few years later, you know, you, you're, go, you're entering a market that other people like, with really, really deep pockets have tons of experience in, and they're already established all over the place. And now it's a real uphill fight like to get into it. If, if the government doesn't step in, if there aren't regulatory obstacles, you know, I mean, there's all of these caveats to this kind of thing, but just the simple market dynamics suggest that, you know, the desirability kind of peaks at the point when, you know, there's, you know, one, two, three, four kind of million vehicles out there. And when you get to the 20, 30, 40, there's still people, that's still a really interesting market. Like, you know, instead of making, 
in, instead of making like a hundred billion dollars a year, it's five hundred billion dollar a year market. So it's still good. It's good money, but it's good money at you know at ten x lower margin than you were getting before. It's just right. vastly more business, right? What a time! What a freaking time! It re it really is unbelievable. And I and you know. <laughs> if I ask this next question, we're going to go another two hours. So I'm going to shut up and we'll, we'll save it for maybe another time. But it's like right. the implications of Tesla FSD working as a level four or five system, which is going to be essentially the same architecture kind of that the bot's going to leverage. And that opens up that discussion too. Because if, if Tesla has figured out how to do the robotaxi, doesn't that imply they'll figure out how to do bot? But we'll save that for another day. Bot's different. Yeah. It, the, I mean, it's... It's a great indicator that things are going in the right direction. And yeah. there are many common elements that is true, but the bot is a different problem, right? You don't automatically win one if you win the other. Okay, fair enough. Okay. You have a fantastic skill, James, of just taking the complicated technical stuff and making it digestible for the masses, truly. Invaluable stuff. Thanks. Thank you, seriously. Yeah, glad to be a service. Holy shit. I'm like mind blown. I don't even know what to do. I did the, I hadn't done the, uh, I hadn't done the robotaxi model in quite a while. Like I built one a long yeah. time ago, a pretty elaborate one when I was looking at all these things and it's been a few years and I went, I pulled down, Chicago makes all this rideshare data publicly available. Like they have a server and you can, so I downloaded gigabytes of rideshare data and I started doing all the statistical analysis because enough time has passed since the last time I did the model and there's enough new data and all that kind of stuff. And I rethought the thing. And it was just like, I was getting, you know, the thing is there, there's, there's so much great data like on the rideshare market that you can really characterize it. Right. And so this yeah. the demand model that we get from, it lets you put a stick, you know, you, you can basically put a stake in the ground and you can say, if, we can, do, you know, if FSD works, right? I believe it's going to work, right? But if it works, you know, we know what the cars got. Like we know the $20,000 vehicle is coming. We know uh, it, you know, I've been driving Teslas for a long time. I know exactly what it costs to operate a Tesla. We, we, we know how many miles they drive. There's tons and tons of examples, right? You know, there's so much of the, of the nuts and bolts of that business where we just know, we know within 10%, 20%, 30%, you know, what the numbers will work out on that kind of stuff. And when you, you do the math, I mean, I did the math with great, much greater uncertainty several years ago, and I didn't even want to talk about what the numbers were because they just sound stupid. They're so big, right? You sound like a fanatic when you talk about these things, but now we're so close. The numbers are almost rock solid now. I mean, the rideshare market has grown a lot. It's guaranteed threshold of demand, which is accessible to this technology. That thing, I was really curious about the whole, you know, I, I've thought for a really long time that key to getting the robo taxi business up to speed, the, a, a, a care, so, you know, ARC does this thing in their model when you look, where they just basically, they assume a price elasticity for rides. And they assume, you know, so many people buy so many rides today at a certain price. What is the price elasticity that gets you to, you know, half, you know, a, a 1.5 trillion mile TAM in the United States, you know? And I went and I did the research on this. This is like four or five years ago or something. And you can't get there with price elasticity, which was really annoying. Like, even if you go all the way to zero cents per mile, price elasticity, it won't get you a big enough market. To saturate and this didn't make sense to me so i started doing research into why do people choose to use a particular mode of transportation there's a ton of research on this because you can imagine like everybody who does public transit is trying to figure out how to get people to ride their system as opposed to the other one whatnot right at the end but the best market when you step back and you look at this kind of stuff is like why do people pay a ton of money to buy a corvette or an SUV, like why doesn't everybody buy a $20,000 Toyota Corolla, right? Because it's not about price, right? Transport isn't fundamentally, now buying a car is a bit different than choosing your transport modality, right? But there are some common elements that go into it. We want comfort, we want entertainment, we want safety, we want all these things aside from the cheapest possible ride, right? So then I started evaluating uh, robo taxis on this stuff and it's just like bang, 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 bang. Like robo taxi wins every single one. So the thing that I realized is like, you don't have to do the price TAM thing. You can keep like, 
Waymo, I use Waymo for all my San Francisco rides now. Like if I'm in San Francisco, I'm going someplace, I call it Waymo. It takes longer and it costs twice as much as Lyft. I just like it, <laughs> right? It's super consistent. Like if they tell me there will be a car there at this time, that car is freaking there. And you, it, it shows up exactly where it's going. There's none of this running around trying to coordinate with the Lyft driver where you're going to get picked up. There's no confusion, right? It's, it's consistent. Why do I pay twice as much as Lyft? Because it's a consistent experience. I don't have to budget an extra 20 or 30 minutes to get where I'm going, right? Because it does that kind of thing. So like, I don't even think robo taxis don't even have to lower their prices in the beginning. That's why it's like, this is going to be such a money maker. It's stupid. It's so stupid. And the privacy variable, I think is super underrated because in, in, in every other use case, unless you own your own car and you're the one driving in every other use case, you're not the only thing in that, in that mode of transport, even on a train, there is, you're not alone. There's somebody up there that's, but with a robot taxi, you are alone. You know, and I think pe people really value privacy. And when you mix privacy with comfort and entertainment and punctuality and reliability and safety, like and it's consistency and consistency, it's, it's just it, stupid. It, it, instant gratification is huge too. Like having yeah. the car there 30 seconds after you, like I was actually, I, I did the math. I was trying to figure out like, how would you have to pre-place? And I had worked worked out all this stuff like how many vehicles would it take to guarantee that you could pick up somebody in chicago in like 60 seconds i was thinking like that would be great or two minutes or whatever because that's that's much less than it actually takes right now like five minutes is good if yeah. you you know if you're in an urban area it's got lots of uber drivers you get it one in five minutes you're doing quite well that like that's good 60 seconds like that's not even possible like it takes nothing. It's like 200 vehicles. I only needed 200 vehicles to put a vehicle <laughs> within one minute of every place in, in urban Chicago that, that you wow. might want to pick it up. So if you've got 2000 vehicles surplus 90% of the time, which you, in fact, it's like 95% of the time, 20% of your vehicle, because essentially it's super peaky, right? Friday mm -hmm. night, Saturday night around dinner time. Like there's this two hour window where you just need like 50% more vehicles than you do the rest of the time. So if you have a fleet that size to do this and you can afford it, right? Because the business has such high margins that you can afford to have 25% of your fleet. I mean, 50% of the fleet is idle 50% of the time. The average vehicle is still driving 55,000 miles a year and is still making two bucks a mile. Right. So you're doing fine. The vehicle only cost you twenty thousand dollars to make. Crazy. Right? It pays yeah. for itself yeah. in three months. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's crazy. It's stupid. It's wild. The thing I was thinking about when you were talking about that earlier was that they're essentially building, you know, the McDonald's of taxis. That it's, you know, it's the same experience. You can have the same taxi experience in New York that you have in Los Angeles, that you have in San Francisco, that you have in Denver. Um, and, and it is that surprising and delightful experience. Uh, you, you know, it shows up exactly when you need it. It's exactly the vehicle that you want for today's ride, you know, and all of those, all of those variables, like it's just, um, it is different, something that doesn't exist today and it's not possible today for you to fly, you know, thousands of miles away from here and then have the exact same type of transportation experience greet you when you arrive that you left, you know, it's, you're not leaving your car in the parking lot and now you're going to have to deal with a different form factor of vehicle um, to be able to accommodate your needs and, and just all these different things like that piece I'd never really thought about before. And I, I think it is going to win over consumers at a surprising rate. Yeah, no, it's why Starbucks is popular, right? It's why McDonald's mm -hmm. is popular, like consistency. Of, see, people go to France and they eat McDonald's. Like, why? I just want something, I'm, you know, <laughs> culture <laughs> shock, you know, give me what I'm used to. Yeah, the Big Mac is too good. All right, uh, I'm going to end there.